Let me explain to you some of the basics of CSS Grid to give you a kind of overall mental model for how this creature works. CSS Grid, of course, is a brand new set of technologies that let us have a powerful way to do page layout on the web. It comes from this CSS specification, where all CSS comes from, a technical document that many different browser makers collaborated on together in order to make this thing exist. This is the official document that the folks who make browsers refer to in order to figure out what it is that they're supposed to build. And if a browser maker ever has a question or there's some sort of confusion, they go back to the people who are in charge of the specification to change the spec, clarify the spec, make sure the spec is what it's supposed to be. That's why all these different browsers have implementations of CSS Grid that are so well aligned with each other. They're very compatible because everyone's working off this document uh, and specifications and the way specs work are, it's just working, that process is working so well now in 2017, better than it ever has before. That's why Grid is, is coming out of the gate just ready to go. This is the level one specification. There's some ideas, and I'll talk about a few of them, about what Grid might do in the future. That will be written up in a level two specification. So Grid level one is sort of done, it's baked, it's locked down, that's already what's in browsers. Eventually there'll be more features added to it, but this is what we've got for now. So let's look at this. Uh, here we can imagine content that we've got or pieces of an interface that we want to lay out in some sort of fashion. Maybe we have this idea in our mind's eye of how these yellow boxes are going to get laid out. We're going to create a grid in CSS in order to do that layout. So there's the grid. Like you design the grid, you design the columns and the rows, you figure out how they're going to work, and then that gives you places in which to put different parts different elements, basically, any element in the DOM. That overall box, the box that is the grid, that holds the grid itself, is called a grid container. And then any particular element that's been placed on the grid is considered a grid item. It's called a grid item. Now, grid items have to be direct children of the grid container. So in this example, there's a main element, and inside the main element, we've got a div, 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 some text, another div, some more text, a section, and a footer. It doesn't matter what those items are, but they all have to be direct children of the main. So basically, anything that is a direct child of that main element automatically becomes a grid item. There's no choice. Uh, and in fact, those bits of text, this is an anonymous grid item, and hello world, those are actually wrapped in elements. So the browser is going to kind of wrap them in what's called an anonymous element, like a fake, like a kind of pretend element for us people who make the websites, it sort of like doesn't exist. For the people who make browsers, it very much exists. Um, but kind of what it means is that if you just have extra stuff floating around, uh, the browser is going to put elements around them in order to get everything nice and neat. It's going to want to take each one of those elements and place them on the grid. Another uh, way to do it, or probably a really super common way to do this, is we're going to have an unordered list with a bunch of list items. The unordered list is the grid container, and the list items are the grid items. Or here you could see body, and inside the body is a header, a main, and inside the main there's an article, inside the article there's an H1, a P, a figure. Also underneath body we've got an aside and a footer. Basically what that means is the header, the main, the aside, and the footer are all direct children of this body element. And those are available to be placed on the grid that we define on body. Everything else, like the article, the H1, the P, the figure, those things are grandchildren or great-grandchildren of the grid container, and so they cannot be placed on this particular grid. If we put a grid on body, only the header, the main, the aside, and the footer can be placed on that grid. This is very different than the mental models we've had with the tools we've been using, all the way from 960 dot GS through foundation up through bootstrap those systems were like you just had one grid you had one grid and you just applied it to the entire website all at once this is not like that at all we're going to be defining multiple grids and using them at different places on the page uh, and in this case if I put a, a grid on the body I can only place these major elements these things that are direct children of the body onto that grid so what that might mean is we want to define a second grid on the article. So on article we say display grid and then we define another grid and on that article grid we can place the H1, the P's, 
the figure and have a way to lay that out. Now we might want the things inside the article to be lined up with the things on the major, on the main page layout. Maybe we want the aside on the, the, the child of the body, the aside that is a child of the body. We might want to line that up with something like the figure in the article. We can't quite do that right now. In the future, with grid level two, we'll probably have a tool called subgrid that will let us kind of create a grid and pull it down through the layers of generations from the children to the grandchildren and to the great-grandchildren and then communicate information back up through the, the family tree. Um, but we don't have subgrid yet. There are a lot of, there's several blog posts written about it. There's some work being done to try to ask questions of people, what they need, what they want, to make sure that subgrid covers all the use cases that we have. But it doesn't exist yet. It's not in any browser yet. So for all practical purposes, it's not a tool that we can use. What we'll do instead is have nested grids, where we have a grid inside of a grid inside of a grid. So the other thing that we'll be doing, because of the nature of grid and the way that it applies to a container and only affects its direct children, we're going to be using grid alongside of Flexbox. So in this example, I've got an unordered list with a bunch of list items. And on the unordered list, I'm going to say display grid. And then each of the LIs are grid items. But then inside each LI, I've got an H1, an image, a paragraph, and I want to lay those out. Now I could make another grid there, but maybe I decide that actually the layout of the content inside the list item could be done perfectly well with Flexbox. So I could put a display flex on that LI. So the LI is both a child of the grid, it's a grid item, and it's a parent for the flex container, the flex box, the flex formatting context. So it is a, it's a flex container at the same time. So overall the concept, you, you have to really kind of know what is a container, what does it do, what are the items, what does it do, how is it that we nest them together. So here's an example, a diagram of an example, very common layout that we've been doing many for many years. We've been trying to do this kind of layout with Flexbox and we've been struggling. This layout, the overall layout of the actual, the layout of the cards themselves is much better served by grid. So let's go ahead and make the overall group of cards a grid container and we'll make each one of those cards be a grid item and lay them out with grid. And then each card is in fact a container itself and we're going to have content in that, in that container where those content that content is are a bunch of items and in this case with this layout we could easily use flexbox so here's a running example that i've put together you can check this out online of that exact kind of layout where the content inside the cards is laid out with flexbox the cards themselves are laid out with grid there's some other terminology i want to breeze past you so that you can see it we've got a grid container grid items, grid cells, and grid areas. So any one by one unit on the grid is called a grid cell. You can also define areas. So an area might be multiple cells. Here you can see an area might be wide, it might be tall. An area can be one cell. It doesn't have to be bigger than one cell. It could be square. But no matter what, every single area is some sort of a rectangle. There are no L-shaped areas. It's not possible. You could define sort of a rectangle up here, and you could define another rectangle over here, and then you could sort of work out your code that way. But there's no way to define, at least not in grid level one, there's no such thing as an L-shaped area. All the areas are some sort of a rectangular shape made up of one or more cells. We also have rows and columns. This is for a horizontal writing mode, which you get by default if you don't define a writing mode. For those of us who are laying out English text, for example, this is the most common writing mode that we're used to. But you can lay out text in a vertical writing mode. For example, uh, Japanese or Chinese or Korean. If you want to, you can lay that out in a vertical writing mode. And if you use grid in a vertical writing mode, then it switches the rows and the columns. And the columns are horizontal and the rows are vertical. You can also call rows and columns tracks. It's a nice generic word. It gets used in a lot of tutorials, especially to just talk about defining your tracks. It doesn't really matter whether it's a row or a column. All the track definitions, all the code that has to do with how tracks get defined is the same no matter which way it is. There's also lines, right? So a bunch of row lines, a bunch of column lines. There are grid gaps. If you don't define a grid gap, then your gap, your gap is basically set to zero. Your line is just zero pixels tall. 
but if you define a gra gap, you can make your gap be a certain amount of space and you can create space between items in your layout very, very easily. You cannot put content in a grid gap. If you want to put content in a grid gap, then really you shouldn't have a grid gap. What you, do, what you should do is make a track and then make a skinny track and make a bigger track and make a skinny track and make a bigger track. And then you can put content in those skinny tracks. Uh, grid gaps are by definition void of all content. Every line is also numbered. And as you write code, you're going to frequently target those numbers and you're going to say, I want you to go from line three to line five and that's going to tell it to run from three to five. One of the big differences though, if you are a person who's used a tool like Bootstrap or Foundation or any other of the many, many layout frameworks that are out there, the float based layout frameworks, most of those frameworks use numbers, but the numbers are the number for the track. So you might say, I want this to run from three to five, and that's going to make it run like column three, column four, column five, which is three columns wide. That's not how CSS Grid works. So you want to let go of those ideas, purge that from your mind. And instead, if you say, I want this to run from three to five, it's going to run from line three to line five, which bridges two columns. A bit tricky to switch, but once we switch, we'll never remember that it used to be a different way. This actually feels very natural and makes a lot of sense. There are also negative numbers in the universe of grid. They do not work like a Cartesian geometry graph. So it's not like you have line zero and then the negative, the positive numbers go this direction and the negative numbers go that direction. It's not like that at all. Basically there's an explicit grid. When you define an explicit grid, it's going to take the very last number and not label that negative one and then work its way backwards. So for example, in this diagram, if we say that, if we imagine, if we just assume that this entire grid that's been defined here is an explicit grid, then you can see the numbers they, across the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, and across the bottom, negative one, two, three, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, to kind of give you two different ways to target lines, whichever one is more convenient, whichever one gets the job done. There is this concept of explicit and implicit. It's used a lot in grid. Basically, anytime you're talking about something explicit, it means that you have defined it. You define the rows, you define the columns, and that creates an explicit grid. There are times when you don't define rows or you don't define columns, or maybe you define the columns, but you don't say anything about the rows and the browser creates the rows automatically. Whenever the browser is creating something automatically for you, it's an implicit context so that you end up with an implicit grid or implicit rows, implicit columns where the grid starts making them because it thinks you need them, but uh, you didn't define them explicitly. It's also important to understand the difference between the grid in CSS and the content or the interface elements, the things that are in the HTML, they get placed onto the grid. Sometimes this confuses people. Those content elements or those interface elements, the things, whether it's a form or a paragraph or a headline or a button or a divs that are, have things inside of them, maybe the things that, that JavaScript handles, those things exist in HTML. Of course, you can style them with any other CSS. If you want to have a headline with a big thick line across the bottom of it, great. It's a headline, you put a big thick line on it with CSS, just like we've always done. And then you can take that content, that H1, that element, and place it on the grid someplace. The grid itself exists in CSS only. It can't be styled, at least not using the grid level one specification. There isn't a way to say, Oh, okay, so I put my headline here and I put my paragraphs here, but I would really like to have a big long line all the way down the side of the page. I'd like to have a big line all the way across. There's no way to sort of have a line all by itself or a background color. You might say, oh, well, I've got my headline here and my, my, my content here, my text here, but I'd actually like to have a big orange stripe on the side of the page. There's no way to make a background color on the empty cells, on the grid cells. Uh, I'd like to see that in grid level two. I think that could be very, very useful. I'm working with the CSS working group to see if we can get something like that. Doesn't exist yet. So what you need to do instead is have an element and place that element and then put the styling on that element. So I like to use B elements because they're not really being used for anything else. It's kind of 
obvious that the B isn't really anything. I prefer that to using an empty div, for example. But you could take an empty B element and place it into a track and fill up a whole area and then make that orange or place it across your entire grid and put a black thick line on it. That's what we're going to need to do for now. So I hope those basics help you, CSS grid. Uh, there's a lot to learn, but those are some of the overall concepts, a lot of the vocabulary words that you need to know in order to make it easier to read documentation, easier to read the kind of blog posts that I'm seeing pop up these days.